In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today, we are continuing our series in the book of 1 Samuel. And if you'll look there in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10, you may recall that where we last left off on this passage is that Saul is about to be coronated. He's already been anointed king. Now they're basically going, spreading the word, hey, Saul's going to be the new king. Samuel's kind of going before him, declaring this. And uh, some of these, some parts of, or aspects of this story have already unfolded. We're going to look at sort of the last really big public proclamation that Saul is now the king of Israel. And we find that in 1 Samuel 10, verses 17 through 19, which read, Thereafter Samuel called the people together to the Lord of Mizpah, and he said to the sons of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought Israel up from Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the power of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But you have today rejected your God, who delivers you from all your calamities and your distresses, and, have, and yet you have said, No, but set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. Now, to some extent, you really got to feel for Saul. This is supposed to be his coronation. This is his big day. And God does take it as an opportunity to remind people, yeah, guys, remember, this wasn't my plan. I didn't want there to be a king. I wanted y'all to just have me as your king and just be judges. But now you're going to put your faith in a king, and so I'm giving you exactly what you ask for. And so it's kind of, I don't know, something to pop Saul's bubble, even though we don't really see any, any indication that that's what happened here. But it does reemphasize the point that God's plan was there to not be a king and for him to be Israel's king. So since this is already recorded in the book of Samuel, since he's already told the Israelites this once, why does he repeat it here? And why is it recorded a second time in the scripture? Is it just for emphasis? Let's dig into why that is. I think that it's the same lesson that God gave them at the beginning, but giving it the second time, it adds a little bit of extra flair to it for a couple of reasons. First of all, do you notice how God couples his proclamation here about him not wanting there to be a king? Do you notice that he couples that with an introduction and a history lesson? He just reminds them, hey, Israel, by the way, keep in mind, I'm your God, not a king. And remember that I'm the one that brought you out of Israel. And I'm the one that rescued you from all the kingdoms within Israel that were oppressing you. When I brought you out of Egypt, when I brought you to Canaan's land, I'm the one that took you out of that captivity. I'm the one that allowed you to prevail before your enemies here in the promised land. And I'm the one that allowed you to take this land. You're here because I put you here. And I think that that was wise because what do humans tend to do? We tend to give credit to whoever is in charge. Being somebody that follows politics and talks about it quite a bit, I can tell you there's all kinds of times where people will give somebody credit that had nothing to do with some kind of great accomplishment or some improvement in the person's life. So God is sending them out as a reminder was they're finally going to have a king and have a have Saul crowned before everybody and, and the proclamation be put out that Saul is the one that is going to lead God's people. God just wants to remind them, hey, just so you all know, First of all, you don't really need a king because I've been here the whole time. I'm just doing this because y'all have begged me to no end to do so. And second of all, remember who I am. Remember that it's not a king that delivered you from Egypt. That was me. Remember that it wasn't a king that established you in this land. That was me. And so don't forget who is the one that actually takes care of you. And so I think that there is a lot of important truths in that. First of all, let's remember, people have short memories. I mean, anybody that has studied politics or religion or history 
understands how short people's attention spans and memories are. And this is back before they had 10,000 distractions, like, you know, a screen the, that fits in their pocket that can tell them literally anything they have ever wanted to know. The, the entire collected wisdom of mankind, including the scripture, contained in a little rec, uh, plastic rectangle that we keep in our pockets. That's before they had those. And people, even back then, had short attention spans and short memories. And it would not be inconceivable at all to imagine that they might forget who really brought them there and the reason they were actually in Israel because they did this all the time. They had already done this several times beforehand, even in the short, relatively short time they had been in Israel by the point that they started having kings and the time of judges came to an end. But I think part of the reason that God did this as well is we have to remember the context in which this takes place. Royalty worship was not an abnormality. In fact, it was the norm. People usually worshipped their nobility. In Egypt, for example, which they had come out of in that society, Pharaoh wasn't just king, he was literally a god. He was listed among the gods of Egypt, and he was on equal footing with them. And when the pharaohs died, they joined the gods. When it came to other cultures, whether it was the ones that they were surrounded by, the pagan cultures in the promised land, whether we're talking about societies in the Far East, people worshipped their rulers as though they were deities at that time. They would worship some non-ruling deities as well, but ultimately they saw a lot of their kings and queens and royalty as on par with actual gods. And God knew, especially with these people that had a horrible track record of falling into paganism, there was a darn good chance they were going to fall into a lot of their other practices as well, and, and probably did. But another thing, and I think that this may be the more important part of this, is that God was pointing out, look, I liberated you. I'm the one that brought you out of Egypt. I'm the one that saved you from the people that wanted to oppress you once you got to the promised land and have kept you free and safe ever since then, that have driven your enemies away from you when they came after you and tried to take the land again. I'm the one that protected you. I'm the one that brings you liberty. The king didn't. And by the way, you're opting to be oppressed. I brought you out to be a people that is distinct, a peculiar people that just lived with God as your king, and you didn't want it. You wanted to be like everybody else. You wanted to have the same oppressions. You wanted to have the same system that they did. So fine, you got your way. I hope you're happy. And I don't mean to be overly sarcastic or make God sound like he's bitter because he genuinely wants them to understand that the choices they have made is going to hurt them. Just like a loving parent tells some, when, when their kids make a decision that is stupid or reckless or hurtful to them, they say, okay, I, I can't stop you, but I hope you understand what you're getting yourself into. I'm trying to warn you, this is why this is a bad decision. And God is trying to impart that wisdom to them. They were under the same kind of oppression in Egypt where they had a king that was worshipped like a deity. And then... As soon as God led them out, what's the first thing they did when they got to Sinai? They built an idol. They had just escaped the slavery of idolatry. They had just escaped the oppression of having a God made out of the workmanship of men's hands, and they went right back to it. Because at their core, they were still slaves. They still had the slavery mindset. They were still an oppressed people. And even when God offered them liberty and held it out to them and said, please take it, they said, no thanks, we're good. And isn't that what people do today? When we hold out all the blessings and gifts that Christianity can offer people, the peace that passes all understanding, the contentment, the joy, the family aspect of the church, all of that, how many people, the majority of people, they go, I'm good. I'll just stay a slave to my sin, a slave to my own impulses, a slave to whatever else it is that I'm worshiping. I don't need that liberty. I'm, I'm fine. You see, this is a lesson that speaks to us today just as much as it did to the Israelites that were engaging in this practice back then, that were dying to have a king even though they were freer and better off without one. 
You see, they rejected God as their king, and most people today do the same thing. Most people today look at the blessings that God is offering them and just slap his hand away and go, nope, not interested. It really is sad and sobering. But ultimately, it gets to a deeper issue that affects them and it affects us too. They weren't content with God. They didn't think that God was going to be enough. They didn't think that what God was offering was worth it. They didn't think that the, any sacrifices they would have to make, and in their case, being different than all the other nations, like that was such a big deal. They didn't think it was worth what God was offering them. And that's the thing that we struggle with every day. When we get tempted by sins, when we want to engage in those things that we know we're not supposed to do, when we rebel against and disobey our Lord and Savior, what we're essentially saying is, God, we don't want the liberty that you're offering us. We don't want it. We'll let something else be king of our life. It'll be fine. Either we'll be king of our own life or we'll make something else, some idol or even some person, king of our life. We don't need you to run our lives for us. Well, yeah, actually we do. And if we do, we would be far more content, far more joyous. For people that are outside, they don't really understand how much better a life lived with God's purpose at its core really is. And that means just like God is reminding them of this here, it's our jobs as Christians, as representatives of Christ here on earth, to do the same thing for our brothers and sisters in the rest of humanity. Stay the course, friends. <laughs>